I am still Peter Ham. This is the Reverend Dr. Ruth Shaver, our wonderful intro pastor. Welcome all of you here today. I'm a little slow on the uptick because I forgot my coffee on the counter at home. However, seeing people here just buoys me up. What a wonderful day. The sunshine, a little warmer than yesterday. I don't know if anyone doing yard work yesterday was delightful. Today's supposed to be even, even better. So. Jesus. 
Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in, because there were so many fish. That disciple, whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came into the boat, dragging the rich full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them, and thought there were so many that the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus had appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wish. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, Follow me. This ends the reading. One of the great joys of being a pastor is having confirmation. And it doesn't happen in most churches every year, so it's a special occasion to be able to do something with a group of kids. And I was with them in Vermont Friday night and Saturday. And it is truly amazing the gifts that these young people will have already brought to the church, but what they will bring to the church in years to come. And the reason that they are able to do that is because of the gifts of time, talent, and treasure that the congregation has poured into them and done so with the witness of the work that the church has done and done so with your care and concern of these young people as they are preparing to enter a world that is not going to be an easy place to be a Christian in the way that we want to be Christians because of so much of what has happened. So I thank you on behalf of the confirmation class who is probably just now finishing breakfast, realistically, um, up in Vermont, and encourage you to think about the children who are even now going to be in confirmation classes in years to come as you present your gifts to God. This morning's offering will now be received.
It is right to give out our thanks and praise. We give you all thanks, O God, for you alone are worthy to receive all power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. With your powerful voice and glorious light, you created the heavens and the earth. In mercy and love, you saved a people from the pit of slavery and commissioned them to bring your name before all the world. Your child, Jesus, lived your compassion to the fullest and called us to follow him. When he was killed by those who would murder your way, you raised him to life again and enthroned him as the center of heaven's worship. He meets us in our uncertainty, redeeming even our failures and betrayals, offering forgiveness and removing the scales from our eyes so that we might recognize you in everything and express our love in worship and service. With the chorus of angel hosts in heaven, we proclaim this mystery of life, death, and resurrection, saying, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Therefore, with our hearts lifted high, we offer you thanks and praise at all times through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. On the night that Jesus had the Last Supper with his disciples, as they shared the story of the people's freedom from slavery in Egypt, Jesus broke the bread for them and he said to them, This is my body, broken for you. As often as you gather, do this in memory of me. And likewise, as the supper was ending and it was time to pour out the cup of blessing, he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you gather together, do this in memory of me. My friends, the table is set. You have a place at this table with your name on it because you are God's beloved child. Come, take and eat, for all is ready. I will say that when you receive the elements, please just go ahead and take them and eat them as you return to your seats. And then we'll move on with the service.
<clears throat> May I have my young friends and my young at heart friends come forward, please? I promise I'm not going to make you do anything. <laughs> Hasn't gone well when I've asked them to dance. So I've changed tactics a little bit. Uh, we do have a small group today. Well, you're just going to have to tell your friends in the next couple of weeks what you've seen. You know? They might not believe you. They might be like doubting Thomas. There we go. Okay. Well, that actually works out really well. So you know, the story that you all are going to hear today in Sunday school, and we're going to hear it on the 15th of May, is about a man named Saul. And Saul was a very devout Jew, which meant that he worshipped God, and he lived by the very strict rules of Judaism. And he was a teacher, he was a, a sort of somebody that really expected people to follow the rules and be exactly what he was, to the point where he went around and persecuted the people who followed Jesus, which means that he tried to get them in trouble, he would um, get people to follow after them and call them names, he would get them arrested, because he thought that they were doing something wrong. And one day, as Saul was going to a town called Damascus, which is in a country called Syria, something really incredible happened to him. He saw a blinding flash of light, and that means he was really struck blind, like he couldn't see. And for three days, he couldn't see until a man named Ananias came and explained to him what he had seen and heard. What he had seen and heard was the glory of Jesus and Jesus' voice saying, Saul, why are you persecuting my people? Why are you getting them in trouble? This is the way they're supposed to be living, and I'm calling you to do the same thing. And all of a sudden, Saul realized that God changed the music on him. He'd been dancing one way his entire life, and then all of a sudden, something changed. So I'm going to ask Mr. Ham and Mr. Kelsey to come and demonstrate this. So Peter, Dick, would you help me out here? They got themselves in trouble when they preached for me back in October. Emma? changed the 
get something completely new. And you can see that when Emma changed the music, sometimes Mr. Hammond and Mr. Mr. Cousin were sort of like, what is this? And then there were other things that they knew, right? And that's kind of what happened to Saul as he learned about Christianity. There were lots of things that he already knew. But then there were some, mu some musical changes that were like, I have to do this? And he sometimes had a hard time. But he learned, and he became one of the people who is most important in our Christian faith. We often call him Paul. But his name was Saul, and Paul was the version of his name that Greek people used. So that's why we know him as Paul, but his name was really Saul. So you're going to learn about him downstairs in Sunday school. We're going to talk about him in two weeks, so remember this. And please tell people, you know, because I want to be able to reference it. They're all going to look at me like, you know, Doubting Thomas. So um, we will we will hear about your, your, your story that day. is going to be something else, but it will all be related. So let's say a prayer. Gracious God, we thank you that even when you change the music in our lives, you sometimes give us music that we recognize or a rhythm that we can find, that we can live the way that you want us to. Help us to not be afraid when the rhythm changes or the music changes, but help us to learn to dance to all the music in our lives and all the stories and all the things you ask us to do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we will see you guys after church. Please join us for the next hymn, a reflective one. By Jesus, I love thee, number 468. <laughs>
poor Simon Peter. This story bookends what happened on the night that Jesus was betrayed. This story is really about God changing the tune for Simon Peter from a life of despair and grief and shame to a life of empowered witnessing to the resurrected Christ. How many times did Peter betray Jesus on the night that Jesus was arrested? How many times did he deny him? Three, right? How many times did Jesus ask Peter, do you love me? Three, right? The parallelism is important there. Because each one of those times, in the Greek, Jesus uses a different verb, a different kind, a different depth of love. And that third time he asks, and the, the time when Peter gets so incredibly annoyed, is that deeply passionate friendship kind of love that is all in. It's the kind of love that you would have for um, comrades in arms. The kind of love that means you are dedicating your life to this person and to what this person stands for. And, you know, we've seen Peter, especially in the Gospel of John, come off a little bit like a buffoon. And there are those who speculate that that's what this reaction from Peter is supposed to be. It's like him just going, I just said it, didn't I? But I'm not sure that that's what it is. I think it's Peter's way of trying really hard to reject the love that Jesus was showing him and not being able to in the end. I think it was Peter pushing back against Jesus saying, I'm not worthy of this. Why are you asking me to love you? and Peter ultimately being unable to reject that love. When you think about it, if we didn't have this scene of Peter being redeemed, would it make any sense that a few weeks later it's Peter who's preaching on Pentecost? And not just preaching, but preaching. When we get to Pentecost, we hear some ridiculous number of people are converted on the spot just from Peter's preaching. And why would anybody be converted by someone who hadn't been forgiven? Sometimes God changes the music in our lives by forgiving us and setting us free. And it's not even so much that God forgives us in that moment, it's that God reminds us that we are already forgiven. And that God's love has already empowered us to be witnesses to that love and that power of forgiveness. When was the last time you forgave yourself for a mistake? When was the last time you looked yourself in the mirror and said, you know what, I screwed up, but it's okay? Maybe it was a little tiny thing. If you're like me and the perfectionism creeps in, it's like, ah, oh, why did I say this instead of that? Might be a three-word difference, but oh, I could have said that so much better. I don't listen to my sermons when I put the videos up. I make sure that they're all there and that you can hear them, but... I don't listen to them because I know I would want to overdub them and say things a little differently or a little bit more clearly. That's the perfectionist in me. And I have learned in this pandemic time to let that go most of the time because otherwise I would drive myself crazy. But then there's the bigger things. The things that we do consciously or unconsciously that we know have hurt ourselves or worse, have hurt other people. And maybe it was something we've said in anger. Maybe it was something we thought would be funny to say in the moment that came off the wrong way. Maybe it's that lashing out at your children or your spouse when they caught you in a bad moment. Or maybe it's somebody at work that 
caught you after the boss had you know, yelled at you or brought you a whole big project to redo because the directions weren't clear the first time and the boss isn't taking responsibility for that. And you just lash out at someone. And it's hard sometimes for us to forgive ourselves. But this story, this demonstration of what it means to be forgiven is a powerful message for us. Because Peter could not have gotten to the point that he could stand up and preach the Pentecost message if he hadn't heard and accepted the forgiveness that Jesus offered him. And a lot of times we hear forgiveness, but we don't accept it because we don't think we're worthy. We don't think we've earned the right to be forgiven from ourselves or from other people. Or nobody's told us that we're forgiven. Maybe it's a situation where it's too late to ask. Or a situation where the person that you've hurt is not interested in conversing with you. Maybe, maybe they've forgiven, but they won't let you forget. Maybe they've forgotten, but haven't forgiven. And that burden of guilt and shame that we carry around is huge. When we talk about Saul in a couple of weeks, his burden of guilt is different because Saul was doing what he thought was right. He had no reason to think otherwise at the point of his encounter with the blinding light on the road to Damascus. But for Peter, he knew what he had done. Jesus had said at dinner that someone was going to betray him, and Peter knew it wasn't going to be him. He was cocksure and absolutely 100%, yes, God, I am behind you. Go, Jesus. And then when confronted, are you a Galilean? Are you with him? Oh, no, I don't know him. I have nothing to do with him. Three times. And then the cock crowed. And we see it in that story that he slinks away, doesn't go to the foot of the cross. What he does do on Easter Sunday morning, according to the Gospel of Luke, is to run to the tomb. And I don't know whether he runs there out of shame or out of hope. But he runs to the tomb. Because sometime between Thursday night and Sunday morning, he has realized that there's power that he hasn't yet been able to claim. And in the Gospel of John, when they're off at the Sea of Galilee fishing, you have to think that at some point the disciples realized, well, we don't have the job anymore. We're not following Jesus around. We better go back to fishing. Either because they needed income or because it was all they knew how to do without Jesus to lead them. But it was comforting and it was hopeful. And so Jesus lets Peter go back to where he is comfortable and safe. And then gives him the most dangerous message of all. I love you. You love me. Now go do. And perhaps that is the music that we're most afraid of changing. We're most afraid of the music when God changes it, and it's the music that's telling us we have to go do something. And maybe it's as simple as going to invite your neighbors to come to church. Or maybe it's as complicated as responding to a call to be in ministry of some kind. 
perhaps ordained, perhaps teaching, perhaps leading in another way. But when that music changes, if we respond, amazing things happen. Learning to dance when God changes the music is how we get through this life of faith. And one of the things that our confirmation students will face in their lifetime is many, many, many changes of tune, many changes of music in their lives of faith. For some, it will be a new church home when they go off to college. For some, it may be a new variety of faith when they meet a partner. For some, it might even be a time in the wilderness before they come back. But all of us who have been through these changes of music with God and learned to dance somehow, whether we look foolish or not, in the process of dancing with God, have wisdom to share. So I invited you last week and I will invite you again. There are feet on the communion table, the altar, and you are invited to take those, bring them back on the 15th so I can collect them and I'm gonna make a booklet for the confirmation students of your collected wisdom about how to dance this life of faith. And it can be short and pithy, it can be long, you know, longer, whatever the case may be. Once I get them, I'll figure out how to put it all together. Um, some of them look like right feet, some of them look like left feet, so whichever side of the foot you ride on is fine. But it would help to have some left feet, because I think most of them are right feet. It's hard to dance with just one right foot. I tend to go in circles that way. But this is a time for you to share that wisdom, to share what it means to accept that forgiveness from God, what it means to claim God's love for yourself and be empowered and inspired by it, what it means to be a person of faith. So I hope that the pile will dwindle, and Mary, if you would be so kind as to remind folks next week, because it works perfectly with what you're preaching next week too. Um, to do that and then just bring them back on the 15th. I'll have a basket in the back. It will be a great way to share with our confirmation students about what it means to dance this life of faith with God. Alleluia. Amen. One of the ways that we dance with God is by sharing our joys and concerns one with another so that our prayers can be lifted up from the congregation. And I didn't receive any specific ones this morning, but I know that we continue to pray for all the folks in Ukraine and for people in Russia who are realizing day by day that their government has imposed a war on them that is one without valor and without reason. So, prayers for that. Mary. Um, just Loretta Mason has a very bad cold and is watching that so far Earl doesn't have it. So, please keep the Masons in your prayers. Yes, the Masons and the Angalas as well. Yeah. Prayers for my uncle Jeff who had an aortic aneurysm this weekend. We can't operate it until we hear an infection from the bloodstream. And on top of it, they found Several huge things facing him and my dad coming out this weekend. He doesn't have anyone that takes care of him. So we keep him in your prayers every week. Pressure on Emma's Uncle Jeff. That is very, very, very scary. And prayers for the confirmation classes. They return from Vermont later this afternoon. Yes. Pelletier. Chemotherapy. Yes. Heard from my sister Joyce, who's um, has chronic lymphocytic leukemia and starting a treatment tomorrow. For Joyce, who's, we have many folks who are starting or are in um, chemotherapy regimens right now. Prayers for them. Prayers for everyone who is still dealing with. Um, 
COVID, it hasn't gone away. It just keeps keeping up, creeping up and smacking people in the head. Um, the Rhode Island Association is ordaining Raquel Ray to ministry this afternoon. She's been called as uh, the uh, Minister of Family Life at Barrington Congregational Church in Barrington, Rhode Island, and she has done quite a bit of work as a chaplain, and she is also a veteran of the U.S. military um, and has worked with veterans in her ministry as well. And prayers for her wonderful journey toward ministry and also for a wonderful journey as she enters the ministry as the Reverend. And a prayer of thanksgiving for a small but mighty choir this morning. It doesn't seem to matter what grouping this choir has, it always sounds good. And I don't say that because I'm a member of it. It's just a wonderful group. So kudos for their work. Let us be in prayer. God, who is the master of the music, we thank you for the music of our lives, for the rhythms that keep us going, for the familiar tunes that allow us comfort and hope. And we thank you for the times when the music changes, for those times of challenge and new learning, for the times when you step into the picture and ask us to do something new. For your trust in us and for your ever, ever faithful forgiveness of us that we can do nothing to earn, merely accept and say thank you and move on healed and restored. God, our world is dancing on a precipice. We have used and abused the Earth's resources and now find ourselves at a time when we can either make very difficult decisions as a world community or make the world unlivable in a a very short time in human span. We pray for our leaders and our business leaders that they might have the scales removed from their eyes and that they might understand that there is no wealth greater than the resources on earth and that there are plenty to share if only we will allow ourselves to have a little less so that others might have a little more. We dance on the precipice of a war that engulfs an entire continent. And we know that this is the doings of one man whose country has a history of deceit and overreaching, but we know that he has been empowered by far too many people. And we know that the soldiers who are at war for his goals are young. They only know what they've been told. And we pray that they will have a sense of humanity and that what we now know as war crimes will cease and that those who have perpetrated them will be held accountable. We pray that there is peace with justice and that somehow the threat will not be so heavy in the years to come. We pray for all those who are ill, whether it's just colds, or this new strain of COVID, or cancer, 
or other difficult issues. We ask your healing hand in their lives and that the healing that they need be given to them. And though that healing may not be of the disease, that the healing of spirit and the healing of family and the restoration of love in their lives might be a part of their journey through this illness. But if it is your will, may they be cured. May they be restored to full health. And may they be set free to speak the wonders of healing and wholeness. We thank you for our young people, for their wisdom, for their weirdness, for their love of each other and of this church, and for the love of people of all kinds that they have been taught by this congregation. May the confirmation class, as they approach their big day, be set free to dance in the way that you have called them to dance. And may we watch with wonder and may we be called to join them as they take their own paths and as they lead us in ways that we may not expect, but ways that you have discerned are the path we are to take. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, who danced a path of wholeness and life-giving affirmation of your love, and who gave us a vision of a world restored when he taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our sending hymn is number 715. Now let us from this table rise, and will you please rise? Amen. Um.